morning. It is good to see you. It is always good to be with you, spend time with you, opening the scriptures and allowing God's word to speak to us uh, in a new way. And that's one of the things I hope that this series will accomplish. We are starting a new series today, a, a brief three-week series that we are calling The Trinity. And we're going to be talking about this concept of what is the Trinity? What does it mean? What, why do we need to know what it means? Why do we need to care what it means? And many of you who've been in church for a long time will hear, oh, Trinity, great. What's one? Father. Right? You know they go, oh, I don't need this. The problem is I think too often we, we think we already know everything and we don't open our hearts to hear what God has to say to us in this time, in this place, in this way that might change the way we think about this. So we're going to be spending the next three weeks talking about this most critical of doctrines or in things we believe, core belief about being Christian, about following God. And we already covered this, right? Trinity is expressed in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is, at the same time, diversity in unity. And it is, at the same time, multiple and yet single. Three and yet one. Got it? I didn't think so. The truth is that there are a lot of things in life that can be a little confusing, that can kind of make us scratch our heads. And I, I want to ask you a few of them and see what your thoughts are. The first one is this. Why is the person who invests your hard-earned money called a broker? <laughs> Why do hot dogs come in packs of 10 but buns in packs of 8? With two little children who love hot dogs, I, that maddens me. Why, where do forest rangers go to get away from it all? Why can you be overwhelmed or underwhelmed, but never just whelmed? Right? Why do overlook and oversee not mean the same thing? This is where my brain goes during the day. And lastly, why do people eat quinoa? I don't understand. I literally don't understand. These are a few of the, of the baffling things in life. And, and I believe that there are, are many of us who might think we have a, a grasp on a subject, but we've never really tried to process what does it mean. Especially things that are confusing. We kind of go, I have this level of understanding. I got there. I'm good. That's how I am and was with math. Like, I got to the basic level I needed to be in math. Y'all can keep calculus. I don't need it, right? And I don't even try to understand it. But the problem is the Trinity is not just a knowledge idea. It is central to our faith, central to our lives as disciples, and we have a hard time wrapping our, our brains around it. And I think it's something that this series hopefully will help us to figure out a little bit more about the mystery of God. And I think many folks have been frustrated. You've, maybe you've tried to dive into it, but you just can't quite figure it out, so you, you kind of let it go. But I will say this. I think it is a good thing that God as Trinity is complicated. It's a good thing that it's hard to understand. Right? Because if the creator of the universe, the author of creation, the one who holds all things together, if he could be contained in my small little mind, we would have a lot bigger problems. Right? It's a good thing that God is hard to understand. And this doctrine has been debated, has been written about, has been argued about for the entirety of the history of the Christian church for 2,000 years. It has been wrestled and studied and written about in volume upon volume upon volume. I don't think we are going to conquer it in the next 20 minutes or even the next three weeks. But hopefully we will take a, a good shot at wrestling and seeing what new things God can teach us about his nature as Trinity. The writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament were just as confused, just as at a loss to how to explain this God that they knew and they experienced. They struggled, and they were they troubled the same way, but they believed, much like the author A.W. Tozer writes, always, everywhere, God is present, and always he seeks to discover himself to each one. God is everywhere. God is working that we might understand him, that we might know him more. But at the same time, God is transcendent, right? God is so far above, wholly above anything else in creation. Anything else we can put into words, he is transcendent above all of it. But at the same time, God is also imminent. 
He is immediately right with us, right around us as we prepare to head into Advent in just a few weeks, right? This is the whole notion of Emmanuel. God is with us. God is right here in us, with us, present with us. He's both transcendent and close at hand, right? And from the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation, the writers of Holy Scripture that are inspired by the Spirit, they're doing their best to describe God to us. But the problem is we don't have the words to describe God. So what they have to do is reach for the familiar to help explain the unfamiliar. And that's what the writers of Scripture are doing, trying to give us a handle on something we can hang on to to understand God. So we could say, listen, I don't understand all of God. I don't understand the whole nature of God. But this explanation, this illustration, this metaphor, this example helps me. I'm still a bit cloudy, but because I can grasp onto these examples, I begin to get a picture, a foothold, into what it means to understand God and his love and his relationship with me. And so the the dilemma of the writers of the Bible is that not just one illustration can do it justice. Every metaphor for God in the Bible, if you want to pull it apart, you can find flaws in the argument. Right? But that's okay, because our human words cannot describe God. He's too big, he's too transcendent, too far away from our current existence. But he's also so familiar and so close, so relatable, so accessible. How do you put that context into words? So they use the familiar to explain the unfamiliar. They say things like, God is light. God is like a rock. God is like a consuming fire. He is like a shepherd. He is even like a mother. But there were three descriptions of God that that became prominent throughout the history of even the Israelites and then into the beginning of the new church. And these had become a definitive way in which we understand God to exist. And they say God is like a father. But not just a father, God is also a son. Not just a metaphorical son, but someone who came to earth, put on flesh, lived the life that we live, who walked among us as the son of God. And God is like a spirit, also the indwelling spirit within us. Three in one, oneness in threeness. Any clearer? No. Good. Think about it this way. Maybe this will help. Think about God like time. If you have time, you have time past, you have present, and you have future, right? Past, present, and future. To understand the concept of time, you have to have all three of those. If you remove any one of those three elements, they work in tandem. If you remove one piece of that, without them, you don't have time. You can't understand time without it. Think about it in terms of space, right? Not outer space, but but space itself. If you have a defined space, You have height, width, and depth, right? Three things that define the space that we're looking at or that we are in. And if you take one of those pieces away, you no longer have space. You have a shape, but you don't have space. They all contribute to one thing, but they are their own entity within that. Does that help anybody anymore? No, good, keep going. Today, we're going to talk about this concept, two things today. We're going to talk about the concept of the Trinity a little bit more. And then we're going to talk about God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. This mystery. But the thing is, the word Trinity, if you look in your Bibles, it never shows up in the Bible. It is not a scriptural word. You don't find it in there. The Trinity comes from the wrestling the early church fathers and mothers did with their faith. In fact, the first person to ever use the word Trinity that we know about was a guy by the name of Tertullian who wrote extensively about this concept of Trinity, right? And it became an idea, he talked about it, and when the first early church fathers in 325 AD, they met at a place called Nicaea. The church was in chaos. It was being attacked from all sides. There were were realms of things popping up like the Gnostic movement and other movements that were starting to thread and tear apart the unity of the church with their beliefs. And they said, they met in Nicaea in 325, and they said, we have to define what does it mean to be a Christian? What are the outer limits? 
what are, the, what are the road lines, the guidelines? Anything in that is Christianity. But what is Christianity and what is not Christianity? And they came up with this thing we call the Nicene Creed today. The very first statement of belief of the early church. And it was the first time the Trinity was put into church teaching, into church uh, documents. They said, we, it's so important. We have to protect this. We have to promote this. We have to agree on this at a minimum. The church wanted to preserve the distinctness of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ and that it didn't get lost in translation across borders or across society. Why is it so important that we defend that? Why is it so important that we understand this? We, we as humans, by our very nature, we live by laws of twos. We live by laws of twos. Think of tug of war, right? We love to be on either side of a tug of war. We've devolved it in a con contradictory experiences. This and that. Me and you. Us and them. Me against you. Right? Black, white, Republican, Democrat, male, female, rich, poor. We, we, we love to draw these lines, yes and no, right? It's easy for us to live by a law of two as we polarize ourselves. We can entrench ourselves over anything. If you don't believe me, get into a room and ask them, do they like chocolate or fruit for dessert, right? Do you like Skittles or do you like M&M's? Right? People will go argue about anything. But within the doctrine of the Trinity, we, what we have instead of a law of twos is a law of threes. It's no longer entrenchment and pulling against one another. It's now a divine dance. It's a three-part movement. The biblical understanding of human existence and experience is one of relationship. Not opposition, but relationship. Relationship with God. Relationship with self, relationship with others, and relationship with the creation in which we live. All working together. In the, in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, we see God create everything by his spoken word. But there was someone else present at the creation of the world. If you read the Old Testament carefully, there's also God's spirit which is hovering over all of creation. And in the New Testament, in John chapter 1, we read this, in the beginning the word existed, the word was with God, the word was God, he existed in the beginning with God, God created everything through him, nothing was created except through him, the word gave life to everything that was created, his life brought light to everyone, and who is the word in John 1? Jesus, so at the very moment of creation we have God, spirit, Jesus. And then at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River, when Jesus is baptized and he comes up from the waters, God speaks out from the heavens, says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descends like a dove onto Jesus. In that moment, three in one, in one place, distinctly operating in their own ways, but yet working together. The threeness and oneness of God. And we see this in other places throughout Scripture, but one place that I was drawn to this week in, in my own readings is the letter of 2 Corinthians. At the end of the second letter of the church in Corinth, Paul has written this long treatise on what it means to be a disciple, what it means to live as a disciple for the church in Corinth. And at the very end, the very last thing he says, he says something very interesting. Chapter 13, verse 14. He says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now you might say that's just a, a, a goodbye greeting. But why do you think Paul, at the end of this long treatise, ends with this line? He wants to remind them, if you remember nothing else, people, remember the grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit. That divine dance, that holy trinity is at the core of what you believe. Don't miss this. This is the intimate involvement of God in your life and in your shared lives. Don't miss this point. Because you see, without the doctrine of the Trinity, do you know what happens? We start to see God as a, as a critical spectator. 
as a father who's frustrated, a father who's angry, a father who is upset, who's indifferent to the world at times, who's distant, who just shakes his head. We see these parts separated. But what Paul wants to remind us is that's not who God is. God is an active, full participant in the world. The ultimate participant, in fact. And he enters in to give us his grace, his love, and his fellowship. And in his fullness, God offers us provision, sacrifice, and proximity. Provision, sacrifice, and proximity. He's continually offering grace through Jesus. Love as a father who provides and deep connection and proximity through the power of his Holy Spirit. Trinity, clear as mud, right? We're good? No questions? No, I didn't think so. The problem, I think, is that many of us will never put our full, 100% living body trust and faith into God if we feel like we don't understand him. The problem is that's an incredibly tall task. I don't know of anyone who's walked this earth in this life who has said, I understand the Trinity fully. I understand God fully. And the issue is if we say, I'm only going to put my full faith into God when I understand it fully, it will probably never happen. We'll miss the opportunities that we're given. The author and speaker, Max Licato, in fact, Dave, I think that's what you guys are doing, right? Max Licato studying Romans right now. Max Licato has written lots and lots of books, but in one of his books, he uses this example. He says, imagine you want to learn how to dance for your spouse. Now, I would never do this because I don't dance. I have three left feet. Um, I, I don't like dancing. But imagine you wanted to dance. You wanted to perfect something for your spouse. And you say, you know what? I learned algebra through a book. I learned history through a book. I learned English through a book. Give me a book. I'll read a book. And so you get this book about dancing. And you do all the things it tells you to do, right? He says, you go to the store, you buy the book, you get in your living room when nobody's around, and when the book tells you to sway, you sway. When the book tells you to shuffle, you shuffle. When it tells you to Charlie Brown, you do whatever that is. I don't know what that is, right? And you do it all, you master it, and you get those little paper footprints, and you put them on the floor, and you, you master the steps, and you feel like you've got it conquered, and you call your spouse and say, I've got a surprise for you, honey. I want you to see that I have mastered this for you. And you do the dance, and it's technically perfect. And your spouse says, you did a great job. But you forgot one thing. You forgot to turn on the music. You got so obsessed with learning the technicalities, you never remember the point of the dance. You never turned on the music. You missed the essence of what dancing is. And what happens, I think, when we are so concerned with having to have all the knowledge first, we're so focused on understanding the technicalities, we miss out on what it means for our lives. See, faith is not about knowing everything. Otherwise, it would be called knowledge and not faith. Faith is about staying in step with God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and learning as you go. Learning as you go and understanding and putting our faith in that divine dance, a divine relationship. So the rest, the rest of the time we have this morning, we're going to talk about that first person of the Trinity, God the Father. Now, to, to capture the essence of the Father, God expresses himself through the scriptures. And we need to look no further than Jesus Christ himself. When speaking to his disciples, he said, look, this is how you should pray. And then he follows with a prayer that if you pay attention every Sunday, except on Communion Sunday, we pray at the end of our prayers together. And we pray, what do we call it? The Lord's Prayer. Right? The Catholics call, even call it the Our Father. Right? Jesus says, when you're praying to God, you address God as Father, as Abba. Right? You need to understand that Jesus, you need to understand that Jesus, Jesus and God are one. They are one together. And not only is Jesus the Son of God, but you are a beloved child of God. You should call him Abba, Father. When you pray in this way, use that prayer. And what Jesus says to the world that hears it for the first time is earth-shattering. It's redefining because to that point, God was a supreme being up here that other people had to talk to for you. You couldn't talk to God. 
You are welcomed into the family of God. You are a beloved child, part of this relationship. Jesus is taking this transcendent deity and he's, that people don't understand, that people can't see. He's, saying, he's like a familial loved one. He's your father, our father. God is our Father and we are His children. And the authors, if you read your New Testament, they write about this all the time. One letter in particular is 1 John. The Apostle John writes this in chapter 3. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. What great love the Father has lavished. I love the exclamation points that John puts in there. This familiar relationship is so important, it's emphasized. Jesus' invitation through prayer to say the Our, the Our Father, and John's invitation to us to see God in this new way, as a God who loves you and who loves me. You see, up until this point in time, the ancient gods of the Near East, they were only understood in one way, as angry, vengeful, disappointed, irritated gods who had to be pleased or made happy or else. Bad things were going to happen. But Jesus and then John, they say, again, look again, that's not who the author of creation is. That's not who God is. God is a one who lavishes love on those he loves, on his children. Now, I, I want to take a disclaimer moment here and say I understand that there are probably people in this room or watching online for whom this is one of the hardest concepts to grasp because you didn't grow up in a home with a loving father. Either you didn't have a father figure in your life or your father was angry, vengeful, irritated, demanding, terrifying. And maybe for you, that, that's been a roadblock. You're having a hard time getting on board with God the Father because that's not who your father was. You see, as children, we're meant to learn theology through our parents. Church is great, but we're meant to learn theology through our parents. Why? If you Think about it this way. If your kids or grandkids come to church every week, even for two hours a week, they're in church two hours a week. Do you know how many hours a year that is? 104 hours a year. If you're here for two hours every day, every week. That's 157,000 hours until they're 18. Do you know how many hours that is in 18 years? It's 1,800 hours. Less than 1% of a child's life. They're in church two hours a week. Less than 1% is in church, even if you're here every week for two hours. Theology is meant to be learned at home, through parents, to understand who God is. Sometimes it's helpful, but sometimes that can be harmful. Perhaps one of the best things we can do today in reframing our understanding of God is to understand that just because your father wasn't perfect, just because your father wasn't the best example, doesn't impact your relationship with your heavenly father. God's love can heal you from those other harms. Our love of our heavenly father allows that. To see him and to know him. John describes our heavenly father like this. He says our father loves. Purely, pure and simple, loves. And the word he uses, the Greek word we talk about this a lot, is the word agape. Complete, selfless, sacrificial love. Unconditional. If you want to know what God is like, he's like a God who loves with agape because he has existed from past to present into eternity. He's ever giving, ever receiving relationship in partnership with the Son, with the Holy Spirit, has been lavished, has been lavishing his love upon you unconditionally. You are his beloved children. That love is not given based on our ability to obey. It's not given based on our willingness to obey. Thanks be to God. But we are loved by the Father. We are his family, his children. In the 1930s, Ernest Hemingway, y'all know Ernest Hemingway, right? Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story called The Capital of the World. And within that short story, there's sort of a, a mini short story that's not really fully fleshed out. But the story talks about this father in Spain who had a troubled relationship with his son. 
And his son ran away. His son, all he wanted to do was be a bullfighter. And so he ran away. And his father is heartbroken. And he searches and searches and searches for his son, and he can't find him. And eventually he says, I only have one thing left. He's got to be in Madrid. Madrid's the bullfighting capital of Spain. He's got to be in Madrid. So he goes to Madrid, and in a last-ditch effort to find his son, he puts out an ad in El Liberal, which is the paper in the story. And he puts an ad in the paper, and it says this. It says, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this hotel at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, Papa. And on Saturday at noon, the father arrives, and there are 800 Pacos outside the hotel, hoping it was their father that wrote that note. Believing all was forgiven, that they were loved, what if, what if for many of us in this room today, one of the reasons we have a hard time connecting with God is because we've become estranged from God. We've run away from God. We found ourselves far from home. And we don't realize that what's on offer is this ever, never-ending, full-throated forgiveness of love that is lavished upon all of God's children. It is who you are. You are loved by God. And there is nothing you can do about it. You are loved by God. You are his beloved children, his sons, his daughters. And the good news of the gospel is that we have a heavenly father who wants nothing more than to pursue us, to search us, to welcome us back home. Paul writes it like this in, in the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse 4. He says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. You see, it is God's kindness and God's love that is meant to lead us to repentance, to turning back towards him. Our God as a father loves, and our God as father is patient and is gracious. Now, my dad growing up was not a yeller. Still to this day, he's not a yeller. He's not a yeller, he's not a screamer, he's not really ever really that angry. But what my father always did was get incredibly disappointed. You could just see it. The look in his face, the look in his eyes. What did you do this time? Right? But it was amazing. I look back and I'm like, how patient my dad was. All the things I did that I shouldn't have done, right? Every time I came home late, he was patient. Every time the car came back without gas in it, he was patient. Right? And he's, every time I irritated him and I irritated my mom because I just wanted to be irritating, he was patient. Right? He was patient with me when I broke things in the house, playing ball in the house, because I don't care how many times you tell your kids not to play ball in the house, they will play ball in the house. Right? He was patient with me when I threatened to pack my bags and leave. He was patient with me when I was driving too fast, when I overdrew on the bank account. He was patient. And whenever I did something to harm anybody else, he was patient. And it was his patience that, wanted, that made me want to make him happy. His patience that caused me to want to please him. It was his patience and graciousness and kindness that made me want to do the things he wanted me to do. It wasn't the yelling. It wasn't the grounding. It wasn't the taking away things that I loved. That probably helped, but that wasn't it. It was his patience and his graciousness and his love. We have a heavenly Father who is patient with us that our hearts might turn back to Him. But as a loving Father, part of what God the Father does is, in addition to all these things, He also disciplines us. And I don't mean God spanks us. God disciplines us. He instills discipline. I'd argue the language of love is discipline. It's one of the primary languages of love. Between youth ministry and teenagers and coaching, I've been around teenagers for 20 years or more. And before that, I was a teenager, right? I understand teenagers most of the time. But the thing that shocks me in this world today is I look at families, and this is not a new thing. This has been going on since I was in high school. I look at families, and I see parents who all they want is to be friends with their kids. All they want is their kids to like them. And it has ruined a lot of our culture because our kids aren't being disciplined, right? When we, when we don't discipline, when we don't, 
put love into our kids in that way, we lose the ability to truly express what it means to love. Discipline, when done in the right way, is the language of love. The book of Proverbs says it this way, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. God disciplines us out of love. Throughout Scripture, we see God as a father disciplining his children. He doesn't do it because he wants to ruin their lives or ruin your life. The discipline from God is done in a way that we might experience what healthy boundaries look like. That we don't destroy or harm ourselves. The discipline that comes from the Lord is always because he ultimately wants to keep us safe and bring us back to him. He's disciplines to redirect us down paths that make us look more and more and more like Christ. To lead lives that reflect that. The first part of this Trinitarian dance is expressed as God the Father. And that is what he is. The Father loves, the Father disciplines, the Father makes us and calls us his beloved children. And friends, that is what we are. Next week we're going we're to talk about this, and this is interesting. Right, if God is the Father, and Jesus is the Son, what does that make Jesus to us? A brother. A brother. But in the end, we're, we're striving to understand this Trinity, and even trying to understand God as Father might miss the point. Anne Lamott says this way, and maybe she had it right. I didn't need to understand the hypostatic unity of the Trinity. I just needed to turn my life over to whoever came up with redwood trees. Insert redwood trees, insert anything you admire and you're baffled and you love about creation. Right? What, what if we've missed it? What if we've been so focused on the head knowledge and understanding the technicalities that we forgot the point of the Trinity? I'm going to wrestle with this until I figure it out, and when I figure it out, then I'll say Yes. Or we try so hard to get the right dance steps down, we forget there's no music involved. The divine dance that we are invited into to be a part of this relationship, a part of this journey. What if we took just a moment to focus on the mystery of God? What does it mean that God is a mystery? The one who by the breadth of his hand laid out space, laid out all of creation and yet is just as close to us every time we take a breath. The mystery of God, I don't fully understand. But I want to fully know Him. And I want to be fully known by Him. Would you join me on that journey? To be fully known by God? And to want to fully know the mystery that is the Trinity? Let's pray. Father God, we confess this morning that we don't understand the fullness of who you are. We get the pieces and the parts and we have some grips on maybe what it might look like. But you are so big, you are beyond our human comprehension. And that gives me peace, God. But today, God, I pray you would open our eyes and our hearts out of the abundance of your kindness and your patience, that we might turn back to you to experience your great love, the kind of love that says to us, all is forgiven, you are loved. We might allow ourselves to, to live under the discipline that you have for us, that we might experience the fullness of life. God, thank you. Thank you for this, this tiny glimpse into your nature of Trinity, of who you are. Help us to live our lives by the law of threes and not by the law of two. As we live in relationship with you, our heavenly and holy Father. As we live in relationship with your Son and with your Spirit. And as we live in relationship with one another and with all of creation. Father God, we love you. We need you. We pray all this in your Son, Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.